I got my first arrest when I was 11 years old. You know, you don't go from banging on the streets of Atlanta, Georgia with a life expectancy of 15 years to Commissioner of Juvenile Justice accidentally. You go there because somebody had the courage to believe more and give you the opportunity to become more. And that's what we have to do. That's our real work. Senate Bill 200 is adopted. Since the late 1990s, the rate at which juveniles are arrested for violent crime has been cut in half, and so is the rate at which they're held in juvenile correctional facilities. State policy leaders are now poised to accelerate and lock in these trends toward more public safety at less taxpayer expense. The time is right for juvenile justice reform. We're living in a time now where, where the opportunity has never been greater. We need to recognize that, that we can do a better job with our kids. States from Georgia to Kentucky to Hawaii are taking a fresh look at juvenile justice because it was clear the status quo was not working. Kentucky was spending its money in all the wrong ways. We weren't getting a good return on investment. We weren't getting results. We weren't getting the best outcomes for our most troubled children. When I started to look at the type of kids that we had at the correctional facility, I realized that the overwhelming majority of them were not a risk to public safety. Like uh, many judges, uh, we were committing kids by default. We were putting almost as many kids in some type of detention facility for missing school as we were for committing a crime. We are forced because we don't have those local community interventions to commit them to the state. We were spending a lot of money on detention, particularly for low-level offenders, when we see that that's not a productive or an effective way to invest in the lives of those kids. Research shows that juvenile correctional facilities generally fail to produce better outcomes than alternative sanctions, cost much more, and can actually increase reoffending for certain youth. Putting kids in placement in secure facilities, lock up, uh, does not actually deter crime. Longer stays don't seem to show any positive effects in terms of reducing rate of rearrest. At some point, we should have a way of thinking about why we're keeping an adolescent in an institution for a longer time period. And if there are reasons to do that, then let's be explicit about that and figure out what we're getting out of it. To get better results, states are reducing the number of youth sent to correctional facilities and reinvesting a portion of the savings into programs and policies that reduce recidivism. One of the ways that states can really respond effectively is to be able to sort through kids in terms of low-risk, medium-risk, high-risk kids and to focus those resources effectively on the adolescents who are going to present the highest risk of public safety problems. We require judges to apply risk assessment instruments before they can commit kids to ensure that the lower risk kids are not committed to the state. We're going to see a dramatic shift in the way we serve young people. These reforms, first of all, are going to keep kids who otherwise would have been sent to a youth prison to remain in the community and receive the type of interventions that need to happen in their home. There will be a, a significantly reduced number of actual court cases filed. They will be addressed appropriately with social services on the front end. To better protect public safety, you need to spend those dollars at the front end of the system versus the back end of the system. Everything in juvenile justice is about intervention. Prevent a child learning further criminal behaviors and you prevent a future adult criminal. These reforms are not only making communities safer, but they're saving states money because placing youth in residential facilities is the most expensive correctional option. When you can divert, you can avoid sending a low-level child to detention for $100,000 a year, those savings mount up quickly. In the state of Hawaii, it's costing approximately $199,000 a year to incarcerate a youth. The bottom line is that we have passed a bill that gets better outcomes for children and does so at a lower cost for the taxpayer. As a result of these reforms, we have realized cost savings. In Georgia, for example, we have already shut down two facilities uh, because we are no longer committing low-risk offenders. States are getting to good public policy by looking at the data. Across all branches of government and the partisan divide, state leaders are coming together to assess their systems and find solutions. The collaboration on this bill is key. Uh, we turned no one away. The task force was vital to the process because it, it gave us that credibility and that unified voice to speak with when rolling out uh, a package of le legislative reforms. These reforms are grounded in research and the public supports them. And the public has always been more positive in its 
orientation toward youthful offenders. 85% of voters say they are not concerned whether juvenile offenders are sent to correctional facilities or how long they stay there. What matters is reducing the likelihood of future crime. I really think in some way we're kind of coming back around to what the public kind of expected all the time from the juvenile justice system. State leaders have successfully adopted reforms that will change the direction of juvenile justice policy in the lives of young people. For every child that we divert from the criminal justice system and decrease the chances they'll ever enter it, that's a policy win in so many ways. We go into public service to do those things. That's why we're there. If we continue on this trajectory, the only children that come to the deep end of our system will be the ones that absolutely need it, and every other child in the Commonwealth and hopefully in the nation move forward to their greatest successes.